Hey everybody, I'm Adam Shell, the pastor at Melbourne Heights, and I want to welcome you as we come together to worship today. And I want to start out our time together today by wishing you a happy 4th of July. That's right, yesterday was July 4th, and it marked the 244th anniversary of the formal adoption of the Declaration of Independence by our founding fathers. In that document, we declared our independence as a nation from Great Britain, but that's not all we declared. We also declared that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And today, we're going to continue talking about how we are going to pursue life, liberty, and happiness in our new normal. And today, we're specifically going to be focusing in on the choices that we have to make about the way that we relate with other people as we enter into our new normal. So, if you're joining us on Facebook right now, I want to go ahead and encourage you to hit the share button on this post so that you can invite your Facebook friends to come and join us and to come and join you for worship today. And if you're here for the first time today, I want to ask you to do something for me. If you're joining us on Facebook, make a comment in the comment thread right now letting us know that you're here for the first time. And if you're worshiping with us on our church's website, you can click on that Connect With Us button and fill out that little form. And just by letting us know that you're here for the first time today, we're going to make a donation on your behalf to the Cabbage Patch Settlement House. Now, at Melbourne Heights, we've been partnering with the Cabbage Patch House for years. And we've especially been working with them during this pandemic to make sure that we keep their pantry stocked. So just by letting us know that you're here for the first time today, you're going to help make sure that the hungry in our community are fed. And for everyone that's joining us on Facebook right now, I want to encourage you to interact with us throughout our time together. You can use the comments thread, and you can also use the emojis on Facebook. But we want to know that you're here today. Now, as we get started with worship today, I want to open us up with a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Leslie Brocklesby and our church musicians to lead us in worship through song. So let's pray together. God, as we come together now in this time of worship, we are just thankful for the opportunity that we have to worship you. We're thankful that we can come together, even if it's over the internet right now, God, and that you will join us wherever it is that we are to worship you. So my prayer is that during the time that we spend together today, that you let each one of us feel your presence and hear a word from you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. Let's praise our great God together. Yeah. 
So over the last few weeks, we've been talking about what's next for us all as we continue to live through this worldwide pandemic. And we all want to know what's next because we all know. We all know that our lives are going to be different after the coronavirus. There's just no way that a novel virus that has infected over 6 million people across the globe and contributed to the deaths of more than 400,000 people wouldn't change our lives forever. We just don't know how much the coronavirus will affect our lives going forward. So we all want to know what's next. But like I've told you every week so far during the sermon series, I'm not a fortune teller and I don't have a crystal ball that will show me exactly what the future holds. And you know what? Nobody else does either. So no one knows exactly how much the coronavirus will affect our lives as we enter into our new normal. No one knows exactly what's next for our world or for each of us. And there's a reason for that. No one can tell you exactly what's next for us because God gave us all a thing called free will. So it's really the choices that you're going to make and I'm going to make in the coming days and weeks and months and possibly even years that will shape our new normal. So that's really what we've been talking about at Melbourne Heights over the last few weeks. We've been talking about the choices that you're going to make and I'm going to make and how they'll shape our new normal. And the choice that I want to talk with you about today has to do with the way that we relate with other people. Now, here's what I mean. After we spent the better part of two months social distancing ourselves from anyone who didn't live underneath, underneath the same roof as us, we've all been craving more social interactions and connections. I mean, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed just being able to get together with my siblings and my parents to celebrate a couple of birthdays and Father's Day over the last few weeks. But even though we have all been craving social interactions and connections, in the back of our minds, we still know that the coronavirus has spread through our contact with other people. So even though I couldn't wait to visit with my family once our stay-at-home orders came to an end, I have to tell you, I still don't feel comfortable walking down a crowded aisle when I'm grocery shopping at Kroger. And even though I've enjoyed the cookouts that we've had to celebrate my dad's and my brother's birthday and Father's Day together, I still haven't worked up the nerve to actually sit down and eat inside of a restaurant. And even though it was great to sit on my back deck with my in-laws while we watched my daughter splash away in her kiddie pool, it wasn't that long ago that I almost turned around and left a sporting goods store because too many people there weren't wearing their face masks. So even though we are all craving social interactions, we're also scared to interact with others. Even though we're craving social interactions, we're also scared to interact with others. And our fear of interacting with other people, it's only going to amplify a problem that has been growing across the United States. According to a study that was published by Cigna, which is one of the 10 largest insurance companies in the United States today, almost half of all Americans report that they sometimes or always feel alone or left out. 27% of Americans feel like there is no one who understands them and one out of every five people doesn't feel like they have anyone to talk to. In this study, it was conducted back in 2018, two years before the coronavirus, two years before social distancing, two years before we all started feeling scared about interacting with other people. So based on this study, it's safe to assume that some of us that are worshiping together right now feel exactly the same way that the people involved in this study did. You feel alone. You feel like nobody understands you. You feel like you have no one to talk to. Now, it wasn't that long ago that in our culture, we would have acted like that just wasn't a very big deal. We'd say that everybody feels lonely sometimes. But what researchers have started to learn is that being alone has a major impact on your health. In his research at the University of Chicago, John Cassiopo found that chronic loneliness is associated with increased levels of cortisol, which is a major stress hormone, as well as higher vascular resistance, which can raise blood pressure and decrease blood flow to vital organs. And the danger signals activated in our brains by loneliness, they affect the production of white blood cells which can impair the immune system's ability for us to fight infections. 
Add to that recent experiments at MIT that show that there is a neurological link between loneliness and depression, and there's no wonder that Cigna claims that loneliness may be a greater public health hazard than obesity. And if that's true, if that's true, then we are on the verge of a major health epidemic right here in the United States that has nothing to do with the virus. Remember, half of all Americans said that they felt alone or left out. And that was before we faced a worldwide pandemic that forced us to spend so much time apart from other people. Now, before we go any further, I think it's worth taking just a moment, moment here to define what John Cassioppo and other researchers mean when they talk about loneliness. And according to John's wife, Steph Stephanie Cassioppo, loneliness is a subjective feeling of being disconnected from others. Loneliness is a subjective feeling of being disconnected from others. So that's what loneliness is. But I got to tell you, it sounds a little bit strange to me. And it sounds a little bit strange to me because it feels like somebody is always telling me that we are more connected now than we have ever been before. And a lot of that is because of social media. And even though social media as we know it has only been around for about 20 years, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that social media has changed the way that we connect with each other. I mean, let's just stop and talk for a minute about the most popular social media site which of course is Facebook. About one and a half billion people get on Facebook every single day. One and a half billion people, that's 20% of the world's population, get on Facebook every day. And the median Facebook user has about 200 friends. That means that half of all Facebook users have more than 200 friends and half of them have less than 200 friends. But the typical person has about 200 people that they're connected with on Facebook. Now, some of those people are their family members, and some of those people might be their co-workers, and some of those people are probably folks that they went to elementary school with and haven't talked to in decades. Some of them are people that they haven't seen in person for years and years. But the typical person has 200 people that they're connected with on Facebook. That's 200 people that they can share pictures of cats with. 200 people that they can ask to recommend a plumber. 200 people that can wish them a happy birthday. 200 people that they can connect with just by opening up an app on their phone or by visiting a website on their computer. So how can so many of us, roughly half of all Americans, feel disconnected when we are already connected to so many other people? Well, believe it or not, there's actually a pretty easy answer to that question. And here it is. Having a Facebook friend isn't the same as having a close friend. Having a Facebook friend isn't the same as having a close friend. And I gotta tell you, I'm not saying that to try to demean social media. After all, you can have close friends on Facebook, but just because somebody is your Facebook friend that doesn't make them a close friend. So I'm saying all of this because since the 1950s, sociologists have agreed that there are three conditions that are crucial to making friends. And these three conditions can't be met in the digital world alone. So what are the three conditions that are crucial to making close friends? Well, number one is proximity. In order to have close friends, you actually have to be around them. That's part of why it seems so much easier to all of us to make friends when we were still in high school or in college. We were around the same people for six or eight hours almost every single day. That proximity allowed us to form these close relationships. Now, the second condition that's critical for making close friends is having repeated unscripted interactions with other people. Now, let me explain what that means by talking about what a typical Sunday at church was like before the coronavirus outbreak began. Now, if you showed up on a typical Sunday at church here, you were in close proximity with dozens of other people. So that meant that there were dozens of people that were sitting inside of the same sanctuary with you that met that first criteria for being a close friend. That was proximity. And since you saw them every single Sunday, or repeatedly, you were well on your way to having dozens of new BFFs, right? Well, not exactly. 
And part of the reason for that is that we don't have very many unscripted interactions when we come together to worship. I mean, we used to literally give you the script that we were going to follow each week when we handed you a bulletin at the doors of our building. But the way that we interacted in the hallways and the lobby, it also followed a script. We knew that we had to be inside of our services by 10.30 a.m. So we didn't have much time to break from the script and to go deeper into conversations with each other. So most of our interactions were surface level and casual at best. Now, the final crucial condition for making close friends is a setting that encourages people to let their guard down and to confide in each other. Or to put it a little bit more bluntly for you, you can't have close friends if you don't open up to others. All right. So I know that we've covered a whole lot of information already this morning. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to put it all together for you right now. So right now, we are all craving social interactions. And that's not very surprising since half of all Americans struggle with feeling isolated and alone. We've also talked about what is required to form these close relationships and friendships that we crave. To make close friends, you have to be in close proximity on a regular basis and you have to confide in each other. But right now, we're all scared to be in close proximity with new people because we know that our social interactions can spread a virus that may be deadly to us and to other people. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? We want to be connected, but we don't want to spread a, a deadly virus. So how do we do that? Well, that brings us to the choice that you and I are going to have to make that will shape our new normal. In a world where everyone is at least a little bit afraid of social contact, we're going to have to decide how we'll interact with other people. In a world where everyone is at least a little bit afraid of social contact, we're going to have to decide how we'll interact with others. And to help us think about this choice, I want to show you how Jesus chose to interact with someone that everyone else around him would have been afraid to connect with. So the story that we're going to be looking at today comes from Mark chapter 5. Now Mark is one of four books inside of the New Testament that we refer to as the Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we call these four books the Gospels because the word gospel, it means good news. And these four books, they tell us the good news of who Jesus is. They tell us about Jesus' life and his ministry. They tell us about his miracles, and they also tell us about his crucifixion and his resurrection. And in Mark chapter 5, well, we're going to see how Jesus reacts to someone that everyone else around him is afraid to interact with. So Mark chapter 5, and we'll start reading together at the end of verse 24. Here's what Mark writes. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything that she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Now I want to pause right here for just a minute, because when we read about this woman as 21st century Americans, we read about a woman who has a medical problem. She's been bleeding for 12 years, and she's tried everything that she could think of and spent everything that she had to get better. But there's more to this story, and it's something that everyone in the first century would have picked up on immediately. Because when Mark tells us that this woman has been bleeding for 12 years, he's not just telling us that she has a medical problem. Mark's also telling us that she has a spiritual problem. You see, during this time period, the people of Israel, they believed that in order for the presence of a holy God to be with them, that they had to be pure and they had to be clean. But the law that the people of Israel followed, the law that was given to them by Moses, well, it told them that this woman was unclean because of her bleeding. And not only was she unclean, anyone that she touched would be unclean too. And if you were unclean, if you were unclean, then you were cut off from the rest of the world. If you were unclean, you couldn't go to the temple. If you were unclean, then you couldn't hang around with your family. 
If you were unclean, then you were disconnected from the world around you. And you were cut off because nobody wanted you to make them unclean too. So what does this woman do? Does she give up all hope? Does she go off and hide in the corner? Does she refuse to come out because everybody is afraid to be around her? Nope. That's not what happens. So let's pick back up in Mark 5.27 and we'll see what she does. Mark tells us, Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. So this woman hears that Jesus is coming. The same Jesus that has been performing miracles and healing other people who were unclean. And she decides that she's going to go after him. But she's afraid to do what everybody else who needed Jesus' help did. She was afraid to call out to him and ask for help. And really, who can blame her? For 12 years, this woman has been cut off from the world and everyone, everyone was afraid of her. So she probably assumed that Jesus was going to be afraid of her too. And if Jesus wasn't afraid of her, then the crowd around him definitely would be. No one would want to accidentally rub elbows with her. Because then they'd be unclean too. So you can almost see this woman kind of sneaking through the crowd, dodging and weaving, doing everything possible to avoid touching anyone else there until she could finally reach out and just get her fingers on the hem of Jesus' robe. And when she does that, well, Mark tells us, her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. She was healed. She was healed. But the story doesn't stop there. Mark goes on to tell us, at that very moment, Jesus recognized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Don't you see the crowd pressing against you? Yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, who was full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus, and she told him the whole truth. So the stage is set. We're about to see how Jesus reacts to another person, someone that everyone else rejected and wanted nothing to do with. So let's see how Jesus responds. In verse 34, Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. Jesus wasn't afraid of this woman. Jesus didn't run away from her. Jesus called her daughter. Jesus loved her like the child of God that she is. And this is just one example that I can give you. I could also tell you the story of when Jesus and his disciples were in the region of the Gerasim, and they ran across a man there who was possessed by a legion of evil spirits. Now, nobody else had wanted anything to do with this man, and they had even chained him up as far outside of their towns as they possibly could. But Jesus, he treats this man like a child of God and he helps, them, helps him, casting the demons out of the man once and for all. Or I could tell you the story of when Jesus met a Samaritan woman who was sitting by a well. The woman had come in the middle of the day when the temperatures were at their highest to, to draw water. And she did that because no one else in the town wanted anything to do with her. But Jesus, well, Jesus treated her like a child of God. He sat with her, and he talked with her, and he helped her understand how much God loves her. Or I could tell you the story of when Jesus went and he met that wee little man named Zacchaeus. All Zacchaeus wanted to do was just to see Jesus, but he was a dishonest tax collector, and nobody wanted anything to do with Zacchaeus. So they wouldn't let Zacchaeus get anywhere close to Jesus. So Zacchaeus decides that he's going to climb up in a sycamore tree just so he can see Jesus as Jesus passes him by. But Jesus, he calls out to Zacchaeus, and he asks him to come down from that tree, telling Zacchaeus that he wants to have dinner with him, because Jesus sees that Zacchaeus is a child of God. That's what we need to do, too. That's the choice that we need to make, too. 
even though we're living in a world where we're all at least a little scared of interacting with other people, we still need to treat everyone that we encounter like they are a child of God. Because they are. So when you're out grocery shopping and you bump into somebody in the produce section who isn't wearing a face mask, you still need to treat them like a child of God. Because they are. They are a child of God, not somebody who is intentionally trying to make you sick. Or when you go out to get your hair cut and the receptionist asks you to stop so that they can take your temperature, you need to treat them like they are a child of God, because they are. They are a child of God and not someone who's trying to make your life a little bit harder on you. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't take all of the appropriate precautions when you're interacting with somebody right now. You can treat someone like they are a child of God, and you can still be six feet apart from them. You can treat somebody like they are a child of God, and you can still wear your face mask when you're around them. You can treat someone like they're a child of God, and you can still resist the urge to shake hands or to hug. But as we live in our new normal, we're going to meet people, a lot of people, like the woman that Jesus met in the passage that we just read. We're going to meet people who have been isolated. We're going to meet people who feel all alone. We're going to meet people who haven't had another person to talk to or anyone to confide in in months. And we don't need to see the people that we meet like they're threats to our health or to our safety. We need to see them like they are children of God. We need to be willing to listen to them. We need to be willing to help them if we can. We need to be willing to be there for them. But you're going to have to make that decision. You're going to have to choose. How will you interact with people in our new normal? I hope that you choose to see them as children of God. And I hope that you treat them like Jesus would. Because that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. We don't need to be afraid of everyone that we encounter. We need to see them as people, as children of God, who may be hurting, who may be feeling isolated and alone, who may just need someone to interact with, to bring a little joy to their day. So be willing to treat people like they're friends and not with fear. Be willing to see everyone like they are children of God, and choose to treat them like that too. Let's pray together. God, we thank you as we always do for the time that we've had together to worship you today, God. And we thank you for this challenge that Jesus lived out in front of us. When Jesus encountered this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, God, no one else in that crowd wanted anything to do with her. They saw her as someone who could injure them, someone who could make them sick or unhealthy, someone who could make them unclean. But not you, not Jesus. Jesus saw her as one of your children. So let us see this woman and others like her as your children too. Let us realize that there are people all around us every day who feel isolated and alone, people around us every day who feel like they have no one to talk with, no one to confide in God. And let us be your presence in their lives. Let us make the choice to treat people like your children, to build relationships and friendships, even during this time of worldwide pandemic. Let us choose to be your hands and feet in this world and make the same decisions that Jesus did. We pray it all in his name. Amen. Now, at this point in the service, each week we put this slide up on the screen. And this slide tells you how you can financially support Melbourne Heights. And we put this slide up there to remind you that even though we're still not meeting in person, that we are continuing to do the work of God in this world. We are continuing to be God's hands and feet inside of our community, inside of our church. And we're doing that in a couple of ways. Inside of our church, we're continuing to make regular contact with all of our members, checking up with each other, making sure that nobody is feeling too isolated and alone right now. And we're also continuing to work inside of our community through our relationship with the Cabbage Patch House. And that relationship is changing 
changing just a bit. We've been asked by the Cabbage Patch House to start collecting school supplies for them. So we're going to be putting out a list to you so that you know what supplies they're going to be collecting. So we want to encourage you to join with us as we continue to be God's presence in this world by financially supporting our church. You can do that by visiting mhbclouisville.com slash give. Now let me turn it back over to Leslie and our church musicians as they lead us in our closing song. Before we go, I just want to take a second to thank you for joining us for worship today. It means so much to us that you spent part of your day with us. And if you've been blessed during our time together, let me encourage you to go ahead and hit the share button on this post if you haven't done so already. And also before we go, I want to let you know about what's coming up next for us. Next week we are going to be wrapping up the sermon series and we're going to be talking about the future of the church and how the coronavirus is going to change the way that we do church going forward. So I hope that you'll join us next Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. for that. And I also want to encourage you to join us throughout the week with other things that we have going on online. You can join us on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock for a weekly devotional. You can join us on Saturday mornings at 10.30 for a special kids story time. And you can also be a part of our small groups. Our small groups meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. and on Wednesday nights at 8. And if you would like to be a part of any of those small groups, just visit the Connect page on our church's website and we'll get you the information that you need to join in on one of those, those zoom calls so as always i hope that you guys have a great week and let me lead you in another word of prayer before we go let's pray together god again we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be together to worship you today god and my prayer is that you've helped each one of us to to be challenged to hear that we need to live differently in our new normal, God. That even though we're a little bit afraid to interact with other people, that we are still called to treat everyone like your children. So God, allow us to see everyone that we interact with the way that you see them, like they are a child of God. As we go, as we prepare to wrap up our time together today, God, my prayer is that you will watch over each of us, keep us healthy, and keep us safe. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We will see you back here next Sunday for another time of worship.